Was your foe still your love far from me? You have been so so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so so kind to me. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't keep down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't keep down. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my 
Good morning. I have a few people saying good morning back. It is great when you get to come into the house of the Lord and you just get to hear our families doing life together. And that's what I call the, the, the chatter is just us doing life together. The opportunity just to be able to tell each other how your week's going, what's going on in your life, the good things, the prayer requests. Uh, I always love to be able to come up and just to be able to take that in for a moment. Obviously, I'm not Brother Bob. He's not here with us this morning. So I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we'll get our announcement time. So let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. God, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to the cross for our sins, God. We are here this morning to glorify you. We're here this morning to honor you, and I pray that we do that through our words, through our actions, through our giving, through our time. And I pray, God, that uh, you use Brother Jeff just to bring your word this morning, God, and just uh, let him be your mouthpiece this morning. When we uh, lift up our praise to you, God, I pray that it be satisfying and glorifying to you as well. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a few announcements this morning. Don't forget this afternoon, uh, starting at 5 o'clock out at the Braswell Camp, uh, the address is in the bulletin for you. Uh, we will have our Thanksgiving dinner. Um, uh, make sure you bring a side dish and or a dessert. The dressing, the rolls, and the drinks, and the meat will all be uh, provided by the fellowship team. Uh, OCC collection times, uh, we are still collecting boxes today from uh, 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and then tomorrow from 9 uh, to 11 on the inside, but we'll be receiving cartons from uh, 9 to 3.30 on the outside. So if you still ha haven't had a chance to help but you would like to, you still can do that tomorrow. Uh, for the adults, they're having Wednesday on Tuesday this week. Uh, there are no children's services or youth services this week, but for the adults, the prayer service, Wednesday on Tuesday, that's normal time, 6 o'clock. Uh, the office will be closed on uh, Thanksgiving, also on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the office will be closed. Uh, our Lauderman Christmas offering is, on its, on, is coming up quickly. That's the week of December 3rd through the 10th is our week of prayer. Uh, Brother Jeff normally sends out the, what the each day is, correct? Um, he, so he'll do that again as well. Uh, and then the Christmas offering march will be Sunday, December the 17th. Uh, let me miss Sharon and see if she had any special OCC. Anything special we need to know about OCC? So that number is significant because Miss Shannon has been praying about 400 for the last several years, and we finally hit 400. So that's uh, all glory to God on that. But uh, thank you for what you. bus if you're wanting to ride the bus tonight to the thanksgiving dinner the bus will leave at four o'clock uh, if you're not exactly sure where you want to go or where we're going but you want to go uh, you can follow the bus over there and bus leaves at four o'clock but the address is in the bulletin 
Uh, so you can get there that way. The last announcement is our uh, men's Bible study is meeting this Tuesday at 730. Uh, they're not? No, they're not. I'm sorry. It's in the bulletin, but they're not meeting this Tuesday. We're going to have a time of fellowship this morning. If you're an a honored guest, we don't have visitors here at Heritage Baptist Church. We have honored guests. So if you'll just take the time on your bulletin to pull out this little section on the right and give us just a little bit of information about you so we can give you a little bit of information about us. You can give that to us in two different ways. You can either drop it in the offering plate when it comes around or leave it sitting in the chair when you leave and our ushers will get it. Uh, I do want to recognize we have Jacob Four in the back, back from Huntsville. He hasn't made it back a couple times since. Is this your first time back, Jacob? First time back since he's been off of college, so it's good to see Jacob back with us this morning. So let's give Jacob a hand this morning. <laughs> good to see him. All right, now let's spend just a few moments in fellowship. Tell someone it's good to see him in the house of the Lord this morning. We have so much to be thankful for, and we don't tell um, God thank thank you enough. And we're going to sing thank you. Jesus. 
part of my prayer this morning, I am going to read the 100th Psalm. Uh, I'm going to read it because uh, I uh, have a remembrance of being in the fifth grade back when we used to have devotionals, and it happened the day that I was supposed to have the devotion up front that I had the 100th Psalm to read, and about Verse 3, I started speaking from memory. And then about verse 4, I couldn't find my place, and I started ad-libbing, and I can still see the teacher's eyes back at the back of the class. (laughs) So for your sake, I will read it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto you, O Lord, for we bless your name. For you, O Lord, are good. Your mercy is everlasting, and your truth endures to all generations. O Lord, we are in awe of you. You are the self-sufficient one. You are our creator. You are have done marvelous things. So amazing you are, Father. You have created each of our bodies. You know us each, every cell in our body. You know every atom. If you had not provided your son, for our salvation, you would still be worthy of praise and honor and glory from our lips. And yet, O Lord, while we were still sinners, you provided an avenue for us to be in your presence forever because you love us. This is incomprehensible to us because some days we don't even love ourselves and yet you love us. Warts and all, even though you, through your Holy Spirit, want to transform us into your, the image of your son that we may in eternity give glory to you There are material blessings which we should be thankful for, but we are so thankful that you desire not only that we praise you, but that we call you Father. To realize that you love us. Now, may we return to you a portion of what you have given to us. It's all yours, Lord, but we get an opportunity to show you our love. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
always giving thanks. You know, sometimes it seems like the world has us trying to swim upstream while it pushes us downstream. Or sometimes we are going in that wrong direction when uh, God has a direction for us. And we should always, always have gratitude for what he's going to do for us. Let's stand together as we, we sing. <laughs> short I've got nothing new how can I express all my gratitude I could I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you ever do Good morning. I want y'all to kind of sit back just a second. I've, I've got something that they're prepared to show you, and uh, I don't want any smart remarks about this. Um, it's, a, it's a football game, and, uh, and it's not Auburn, okay? 
So um, thank you, thank you. Um, but I want you to listen closely and watch carefully. A high school football player shared a video of him tackling his own teammate. Oh, so here it is. Oh. First of all, the other player made a great interception, but he ran the wrong direction. So there he goes. You see his own guy chasing him down here. He tackled him at the 10. <laughs> <laughs> Someone on the sidelines right there is just losing it. That would have been a, a safety. I agree. It would have been two points for the other team had he made it all the way to the end zone. I, so he didn't obviously realize it until that point, mm -hmm. hopefully. And look, right. is that the he coach? He still doesn't know. Why is that the coach on the side? Yeah, why are you tackling me? Going on? Well, why did you do that? Oh, no. <laughs> Poor guy. All right. Uh, it's <laughs> starting to feel like football <laughs> weather, though. Well, I think we're past the football weather. I think we've, we've gotten there. Coach, I'm thinking that that guy probably played both ways. What do you think? He, he probably played offense and defense, but he got, he got uh, sidelined there. He didn't, he didn't know which direction he was going. Well, I shared that today because the message this morning is running fast in the wrong direction. And uh, we can be doing the right things, but we can be heading in the wrong direction sometimes. So turn with me over to Romans chapter 10, and I'm going to try to keep you from having to hear me cough a little bit. <coughs> I resemble that statement. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. So if you will, uh, if you have found this portion of Scripture, would you stand with me, if you're able to? Stand with me in honor and in reverence to reading God's Word. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to God, to the God of uh, the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow our lives before you this morning. And we once again want to acknowledge how much we need you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that we have in him. But Father, I pray that all of us are going to be running in the right direction. I pray that we're all going to be running to you. And Father, I pray this morning as I stand in just a moment. Father, I pray that your hand will be upon my life. Father, I pray that this morning that your word will penetrate every heart and every mind in here today. And Father, if we've come in the, the only fellowship that we are able to enjoy is just each other, Lord, we've missed the ultimate fellowship and that's with you. Father, would you do something great and mighty and awesome among us today? And Father, may we not look around the room and think that so-and-so needs to hear this message. But Father, I pray that our hearts and our minds are going to hear the message that you have for each one of us. And that we're going to leave this place changed, convicted. I pray that we'll walk out of this place with the right kind of zeal and excitement and heading in the right direction. And we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that all of us at some point have probably flown uh, in an airplane before. Uh, some of you have not flown at all. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I can uh, multitask, I can drink and preach at the same time. But uh, we've probably, most all of us have flown at some point. And uh, sometimes going to the airport and getting uh, on the, the train or 
the escalators to get to the right place, it can be quite challenging. And uh, for just a moment, let's just imagine that you're going to Birmingham on a business trip. And while you're there, you've got a, a bunch of meetings that are going to be held there. And, and, uh, but after those meetings, you, you're planning to fly out to uh, meet your family uh, for a great vacation spot. Uh, your meetings run a little bit late, so you know that you're going to be, uh, it's going to be a challenge to get to the airport in time and get checked in and uh, that you can make your flight. So uh, you grab a cab and, and you say to the driver, I need you to go to the airport and I'm running late, so step on it. <laughs> so the taxi driver takes you at his word and, and he takes off from the curb and he weaves in and out of traffic and he keeps his hand firmly on the car's horn, and you're impressed by the driver's focus and his determination, and he seems to be making good time. Well, you're not real familiar with Birmingham, but you, you kind of realize some of the surroundings, but finally you, you say to the, you ask the driver, uh, are we making good time? And he responds that we should be at the Atlanta airport in about 50 minutes. <laughs> and you scream, Atlanta, I needed to go to the Birmingham airport. So needless to say, you miss your flight. Well, this is kind of uh, the picture that Paul's painting here. It's kind of like the uh, player that we watched. that uh, He was doing the right thing, but he was heading in the wrong direction. And sometimes we're guilty of doing the same things. But there's a couple things that I want to bring to your attention this morning in the Word of God that I believe really uh, will help us and encourage us. The first thing I want you to notice is that sometimes there's some misplaced zeal in our lives. Now look with me again at verse 1 through 4. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, in talking about his own countrymen, Paul He's saying that they're zealous. He's saying that they're enthusiastic in their pursuit of God, but their zeal is based on the wrong knowledge. In other words, they're pursuing God in the wrong way. Now, I, I know that uh, when I start reading something like this and I start studying it, uh, I find myself probably guilty the same way that you might be. We read these things. And we think to ourselves, well, I would never do that. I would, I would never, I'd never uh, have the wrong zeal. I'd never get excited about the wrong thing, and I'd never get, uh, go in the wrong direction. But if we're real honest this morning, we know that's just not true. Because there's times that we're excited about things, but it may not be the things of God. We get excited uh, we have a zeal about things, but it may be a misguided zeal. And we may be heading in the direction, but we may be heading in the wrong, wrong way. We have so many things that we're involved in, and that the things of God are often pushed to the side. We're involved in things. We're, we're involved in all kinds of things. But sometimes in our lives, the things of God get put on the back burner. In other words, um, Brother Buddy, Brother Donnie, when I was a youth minister, I never could understand sometimes. It used to just really get all over me. You'd spend all this time getting ready to go on a trip. You're going to take them on a trip somewhere. And then um, as it gets a little bit closer to time, uh, you hear from one or two of them say, well, they're not sure they're going now. And, uh, and then you get a little bit closer, and they, they start talking like, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to go. Because, you see, something better came along in their eyes. And what happens is they'll, 
they'll sometimes give him the opportunity to make the choice between the two. They'd rather go have some fun somewhere than they had to go on to camp. Um, you two, I know that you've had those times where you had to get refunds, and sometimes you couldn't get the refund because it was past the time, and, and it's just frustrating. But I'm saying that sometimes we put the things of God on the back burner. Uh, we check our calendar sometimes to find out what's happening and we determine that sometimes we're going to do the other thing rather than to show up to church or, or do the church things. You say, well, I'd never do that. Well, you need to check yourself because we do that sometimes. Wouldn't it be great if we had people that are as enthusiastic about God and the things of God as they were their hobbies? Wouldn't it be great and exciting if people were as, as excited about the things of God as they are a ball team? I can come this morning and I'm, I can tell you I'm more excited about the Lord than I am my ball team this morning. I can truthfully say that. But we can get excited about our favorite TV programs and you know that happens sometimes. We schedule things around that. Uh, when I was growing up, and my, my grandmother and my two aunts, uh, you could always count on clockwork that at 12 o'clock noon, dinner was on the table. Now, if you came at 11.55, it wasn't on the table because the young and the restless was not over yet. Um, it didn't matter. Um, they were going to watch the young and the restless, and then after that, then, then you can eat. Then, But, you know, we laugh at that, but we're the same way about the things of God sometimes. We, we, we think about our, our favorite TV programs or sometimes our, our children's sports and, and politics. You know, I look so forward when, when the election is over. But it's gotten to the place where politics is 24-7. I hate it. I can't stand it. Uh, but could you imagine if we got excited about the things of God like we get excited about the other things in life? Schedules would be changed to make time for God. People check their church calendar before they would ever make any plans for anything else. Worship would be vibrant. Worship would be alive, and people would be attentive, and some of them would actually be responsive. I've always been amazed uh, of having had the experience to go to South Africa one time and, and preach over there and, and get excited, and, and you see people. You can preach on the street corner. You can preach at the jail you can preach at the schools. You can preach anywhere you want to, and there will be a crowd of people, and you'd always see a bunch of people get saved. You can't go on the street corner these days without getting some kind of permit, and, and you certainly can't go necessarily, necessarily to the jail without uh, going through a background check and all kinds of things. But what I'm trying to say is that, listen, in America, we didn't have the freedom that we had over there in South Africa and we didn't see the people getting saved. You preach the same way hard, and you preach the gospel, and people in America look at you with glassed over eyes, where people over there looked at you, and they listened because they were compelled to hear the truth of the gospel. I'm afraid that some of us, we've been saved so long that we've gotten over being saved. That the things of God don't really move us like they used to move us. When's the last time that we've really sacrificed anything to invest in the things of God? The problem with Israel was not their enthusiasm. They had enthusiasm. It was the focus of their enthusiasm. And it's possible to be religiously zealous, but listen, you can be a long way off. You can be off course. Who would imagine that they would have given, some people would have given years of planning and preparation 
and study and, and really looking over the situation and planning to board airplanes and commandeer those airplanes and drive them into the World Trade Center or fly them into the World Trade Center. You see, those people were zealous. Those people, they, they had enthusiasm. But it was the wrong kind. And they were heading in the wrong direction. Just because the Israelites were doing that back in the day, listen, doesn't mean that we're not guilty of the same things. Sometimes our enthusiasm about things are misplaced. Uh, we may be enthusiastic about things that are happening, but when's the last time that we, we really got excited about what God's doing? That's what I thought. We can, we can get excited. You know, it, it kills me, and I say this often, but forgive me. You know, I saw people yesterday that were, they were just flat out insane in the way that they were acting at ball game. It'd be 30 degrees outside, and there'd be some kids there that wouldn't have their shirts on, and, and they had their team uh, name spelled out on their chest. And they're there having a good time, and they're excited, and they're enthusiastic about what's happening. And some of them didn't have a clue about what was happening at the ball game. But, you know, having zeal and having it heading in the right direction, it, it's not hard to, to come up with an example of that. We, we've seen that, of how zealous people could kill others. Paul tells us that they did not know the, that the righteousness that comes from God, but he tells us that they sought their own. In other words, righteousness is being right with God. Their righteousness was according to what they thought was right. And my friends, we're living in a day and time in our culture, well, that's exactly the case. People are no longer concerned about God, what God says is right, people are only concerned about what they think is right. And they're, they're living that way. So, in short, they were not submitting to God's mercy. They were not submitting to God's grace. They were devoted in making themselves righteous. So if they're making themselves righteous, then what they were doing is they were, they were picking out and showing the things that they thought were right. And they're like many people today. They're religious, but they believe that something, it's something that they could do on their own, that they can earn righteousness. They believe sometimes that they can meditate the right way, do enough good things, or maybe they can go to church about half the time but there are many churches who preach the same kind of moralism that you find today that's rampant in our culture. You'll be told more socially and politically and, and uh, politically active things uh, challenge to be more open-minded today than we were 30 years ago. Uh, to become more inclusive of people today. But you don't hear a whole lot about the gospel of God's grace that's extended through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're promoting a zeal today that's without knowledge and a righteousness that's earned rather than received. You see, there are dangers in having misplaced zeal. There are several things that happen when people believe that they can establish their own righteousness. What happens is we become satisfied with our own righteousness. And that's a real danger. We start looking around at other people and we compare ourselves to other people rather than the holy standard of God's word. And we start to believe that compared to everybody else that we're doing pretty good. We rationalize that we must certainly be among those who are saved. Folks, it's a delusion. It's a delusion. In truth, 
all we're doing is lowering God's standard today. But sometimes we tend to look down at other people. We feel better about ourselves because we're not like that person over there. We're, we seem to be better than them. We live by a performance mentality. We conclude that those aren't doing the same things, that they're deficient. Somehow they're failures, and they're people that we despise. In fact, in order to look better ourselves, we're constantly trying to point out the faults of other people. But third, sometimes people get discouraged and they give up. Those who try to achieve the righteousness of God by their own effort, listen, they're going to come to a place in their lives where they're frustrated because of the many failures that they've had in their lives, and they simply come to a place where they give up. But here's the fourth thing. People who focus on their own righteousness, they reject Jesus and the gospel because they don't see any need for grace in their lives. If you feel that you're doing fine on your own, you're not going to come to a place where you see you need Jesus in your life. And another thing that happens is that we misuse the law. We misuse the law. When we try to earn our salvation by law-keeping, it's natural to try to focus on obeying the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. On the surface, people look like they're outstanding law keepers. They were very careful to obey the letter of the law. However, over and over, Jesus confronted the fact that the Pharisees were missing the point. And listen, it could be possible that we're here this morning and some of us are missing the point. It's obvious in our culture and in our country today that people are missing the point. You see, what we really need is godly zeal. We need godly excitement in our lives. Now, in verse 5, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. So basically what you find here is that Paul's exposing the problem. And if Paul is exposing the problem that we have in our lives, then listen, there is a solution. How can we keep from running fast in the wrong direction? First of all, you and I, we've got to always start with Jesus. That's where it begins, and that's where it ends as well. But Paul wants us to understand that the only true way to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. There's not a one of us in here this morning that we can earn it. There's not one of us that's reached perfection. There's not one of us that are deserving at all. We cannot attain God's standard without his help. And there are some of us this morning that we're on the performance mentality. We're on the treadmill of performance, and we're trying to be good enough. And I promise you, if you're sitting here and you're hearing this this morning, and that's true in your life, you're a miserable person. Because you'll never, ever be good enough in and of yourself. And there's people that are killing themselves trying to be good enough. We are made right with God, not because of what we do, but because of what he's done for us and what he's done through us, through Christ. But you know, each of us may come to a place in our lives where we, we feel like we're running, and we're running fast, but we might feel like we're running in the wrong direction. Eternal life is something that comes through trusting Jesus Christ. And a true believer is not focused on the rules and the regulations. They're focused on building a strong relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the true believer understands that they've been granted eternal life in spite of the fact that they sometimes stumble, in spite of the fact that sometimes they fall. 
If you want to head in the right direction, listen, you and I, we don't need to bring our resume to Jesus. We've got to come to him with open hands. Bring him your wounded heart. Bring him your failures. Bring him your sin and ask him to forgive you and make you new. Don't please, uh, don't plead your, your goodness to him. Don't try to prove to him that you're good enough. You and I have got to trust his sacrifice that it was enough. God's zeal hurts for those that are lost. God's when you're excited about the things of God, then listen, it's going to break your heart when you're around lost people. Paul said, my, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved. You see, Paul hadn't given up on Israel. He was still praying for them. He was willing to do whatever he had to do in order to share the gospel with them. But he had never given up. I've got to admit sometimes that in serving the Lord in the local church, there's times you feel like giving up. Because you you see the glassed over look and you see the the apathy within the people and you see them excited about all kinds of other things. But the things of God pale in comparison. And sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes it, it wears on you. But listen, we don't need to give up. We don't need to give up. Paul, he, he ached to see his family be saved. He was aching so that his friends would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time that Paul entered into a town, you know where he went first? He went to the Jewish temple. He continued to look for opportunities to share his faith with his brothers and sisters and those that would listen. And it didn't matter how he was treated. Those people needed Jesus, and Paul was going to give the rest of his life in every effort that he could give to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's attitude is different than most of us today. I read this in some Barna research this week, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It said that 53% of born-again Christians feel any responsibility to share their faith with someone else. Only 53% feel like there's any obligation on their part to share the gospel with somebody else. Folks, something is seriously wrong in our lives. Something seriously wrong if that's the way that we feel. We may be excited about things, but we're heading in the wrong direction if we're not excited about telling people be, about Jesus Christ. You know, people were lost back in Jesus' day, and listen, they're still lost today. They're just as lost today as they were back then. People were looking for meaning and direction and purpose back in Paul's day. Some of them had no sense of purpose in their life whatsoever. Folks, when's the last time that you and I shared Jesus Christ with someone? What's happened in the church is that we have embraced postmodernism. We've embraced political correctness so much that we begin to water down theology in the church in America. We've come to believe, many churches today and many believers out there believe somehow that all roads lead to heaven. And folks, that's a lie. It doesn't. There's only one way. Jesus made it clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All roads don't get you there. It's only Jesus. 
The person with a true heart of God sees people the way God sees people. A person of God, listen, they love people the way God loves them. They, they go after them the way God goes after them. People are lost, and they need a shepherd. And so often, many of them don't know. But, you know, we need to have a proper zeal. We need to have an enthusiasm about us where we're eager to tell people about Jesus Christ. You know, I sent you out a little message this morning. Any of you remember? What, what did I send to you? What did it say? Come with an expectant heart. How many of us came with an expectant heart? How many of us came this morning with great anticipation of what God's going to do? Well, so I am, preacher. You need to tell your face. You need to tell your body language. This is not a funeral this morning. This is a celebration that we're about. Listen, I'm a terrible cheerleader. <laughs> I, I am. But listen, something's wrong with us when we've got to have a cheerleader. There ought to be something that wells up deep within our hearts that we can't wait to get to God's house. We can't wait to sing the hymns. We can't wait to hear the word. But yet so often we come and we're just glazed over and we're just passing time. You know, it would be a terrible thing for the Lord to show up and we come and not even know he's here. He says that when two or three are gathered in his name, that there he will be also. How many of us even recognize him? How many of us get enthusiastic about that? I'm saying this this morning to tell you that we need enthusiastic people. Now, I'm not saying that we need to put on a show. I'm not saying that, that we just need to do things to create some enthusiasm. Listen, if our enthusiasm isn't over Jesus Christ, then it's misplaced. We're running in the wrong direction. But friends, we ought to be able to come in here. We ought to be excited about the things of God. And it'd be something that's so moving that out in the week that people are see the difference in the way that we live our lives. And, and they want some of what we've got. If it makes that much difference in our lives, people will, will want to know what makes the difference. But yet so often they see our apathy and they, they see us unconcerned about the things of God and, and they see us just take things for granted. There needs to be some enthusiasm. Now I'm not suggesting that we need to uh, paint our, our shirts and our chest and not wear our shirts and do the wave and all kind of these things. But I'm going to tell you something. It's high time that, that God's people get excited about God's work and what God's doing. We can be enthusiastic, but we can be heading in the wrong direction. We need some people that are grateful for God's grace, that they're willing to go. They're willing to work. They're willing to sacrifice to reach the lost people to equip those who've been changed by his grace, who need those who will make disciple, uh, discipleship a priority in your lives. But the question that we've got to close with today, are you one of those people? Are you enthusiastic about the things of God and is your life, is it moving in the wrong direction? You know, I was thinking about those football players. I, I'm thankful that he had somebody, a friend, that was willing to, to hawk him down and tackle him on the 10-yard line. Sometimes we need to do that with each other. Sometimes we may be heading in the wrong direction. And listen, we need to pursue. We need to go after those that are going in the wrong direction. 
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me just a moment? Now, at this moment, I just, I want you to think about the Lord. I want you to think about the things that you're excited about and you're enthused about. You see, he knows whether it's him or whether it's something else or someone else. We can be enthusiastic, but heading in the wrong direction. Where are we heading this morning? Where is your life heading this morning? I can promise you whatever excites you is probably the direction that you're heading to. If you're excited about something other than the Lord, then you're heading in the wrong direction. This morning, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're heading in the wrong direction. There might be somebody here that needs to give their heart, give their life over the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you recognize that you're excited about vacations and, and uh, all the extracurricular plans that you may have in your life. And you get excited about ball teams, but you find it hard to get excited about Lord Jesus Christ. That's a problem. This morning, there could be some of us as believers would have to say we're heading in the wrong direction. We get excited about everything else. But we make excuses about not coming to church. And we seem to put everything else before the Lord. That's heading in the wrong direction. And some of us need to do an about face. Some of us need to repent this morning. Some of us need to recommit ourselves. Or maybe the Lord's doing something else in your heart. Maybe God's dealing with you about your church membership. Maybe this is where he's led you, he's led your family to be a part of it. Maybe he wants you to be a part of it by moving your membership here. Maybe you're a believer, but you've never followed through with believer's baptism. Listen, we can help you with that. But there's other decisions that may need to be made today. But I want you to ask yourself before the Lord, are you heading in the right direction? You might be here this morning, you're going through some hard, difficult times in your life. Maybe you're just going to come and pray. Maybe you want one of us to pray with you. We'll be glad to do that. But in the next few moments, I want you to be honest. You can't fool God. Be honest about the direction that your life is headed today. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Father, I pray that we might have the excitement and the zeal that we should have about the things of God. Forgive us for being excited, more excited about other things than the grace that you've shown us. Father, I pray that in the moments that we have remaining during the invitation, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be powerful in this place. Open our eyes that we may see. Open our hearts that we may feel. Show us, Lord, if we're heading and moving in the wrong direction. Do something great and mighty and powerful among us, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Buddy's going to come and he's going to lead us this morning in our invitation hymn. Let's stand together as we sing. And if God is speaking, I'm going to be down front. Brother Donnie will be down front this morning. But if God is speaking, you come. Let's sing together. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give. All that I adore. 
This is my desire, this is my desire, to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have
He, he got a long test drive. He, he, said, <laughs> he said your mic's not on. <laughs> and the reason we say that, just so you know, is so the people at home can hear it. So. Um, Miss Ethel's been coming for quite some time. And um, uh, those of you that have gotten to know her, I know you already love her. And it feels as though she, she became one of us a long time ago. But she's making it today official. And uh, she wants to unite with our church on the promise of a letter from a sister, sister church in our area. So this morning, if you would be willing to receive her into our fellowship, would you say amen? Amen. Uh, any opposed like sign. And uh, we're, we're excited that God has led you this morning. Um, I appreciate our visits together. And uh, I feel like I've known her all my life. And I, I know that's because of the bond that we share in Christ. But, uh, Ms. Ethel, we appreciate you. Uh, after we conclude this morning, if you'll stay standing up here and uh, your daughter can come and stand with you. And if you really need some backup, we'll get Marshall to come down here too. <laughs> but, um, but we just want to have an opportunity to come by and greet you and welcome you into our church this morning. I, I believe that, and I know she means that. Um, we're, we're going to conclude this morning, so uh, Miss, Miss Ethel, you stand right here with me, and uh, Deborah, you come and stand with her, and uh, we're going to dismiss in prayer. Uh, got a lot going on today. Uh, OCC's uh, working hard this afternoon. Uh, then uh, tonight, we're going to have our fellowship meal uh, out, out at the Bradpool camp. Uh, the directions, I think, have been given to you. Uh, if you want to follow the bus, then you need to be here pretty close to 4 o'clock. Isn't that right, Brother Tom? They're going to pull out at 4. Uh, but I hope that you can make it. We always have a great time of fellowship, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, let's see. Is, uh, where's Tollett? Oh, there he is. He's sneaking up on me over there. Come on up, my brother, and you uh, dismiss us in prayer. And then before you leave, you make sure that you come by and you greet Miss Ethel and let her know how much we appreciate her uh, joining and being part of our fellowship. And uh, uh, Donnie's going to, he's going to guard the back door, so you're going to have to go out this door and shake my hand, all right? But uh, thank you for being here today, and I pray this will be a great, great week. Heavenly Father, we have so much to acknowledge as you have been very kind to us. And we just praise your name. Father, during this coming week, many of us here will sit around a table, perhaps with those who do not know you. And although it may not necessarily be politically correct, Father, we ask that you help us with tact to say that this is not the celebration of the great bird or the royal cranberry sauce, but it is a remembrance of the thankfulness that the pilgrims had when they came to this country experiencing hardship and knowing that you led them here and that you continue to lead your people. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit lead us in the continual fact I know in the past I've probably been part of the 